having sort of beginning to form my identity as a photographer and you know you do it very often against figures that often you admire or that and so you're sort of forming your identity as a creative against someone that has uh, some recognition does interesting work but you're also wanting to differentiate your your methodology from theirs Because of my freewheeling, <laughs> adventurous uh, childhood, I wasn't actually timid about going to an entirely different city and quite a big city. So when I was, uh, I guess I was 21, I arrived in Paris, enrolled in the American University of Paris, studied uh, French art history and uh, French history. So I hung out with French uh, people that I would meet in cafes. So that eventually was how I also became f very fluent in French. Afterwards, I, I then studied in a foundation course called L'Atelier, which is in Rue de Seine, which is right is and is still there but in a different form that prepared uh, young artists to enter the exams of Les Arts de Rocco, the Beaux Arts, etc. So there, in fact, I studied the academy, which I constantly now, you know, sort of make fun of and have chal try and challenge. And this academic viewpoint of art was that you copied, that you copied uh, plaster casts, the sort of plaster casts that if you go to, into the bazaar you find all over the bazaar. Uh, and then what you do is you paint and then still lifes after Cezanne, you know. This whole training of I guess it's come in very much in handy and very useful to me, a very concentrated looking. And I still do that today. I spend a lot of time in a place looking and thinking and being immersed in the environment that I'm about to photograph. So that discipline, I guess, of looking which was very useful, although later, you know, of course I was very flippant. What was that worth? You know, what was that? And at one point when I was younger, I was thinking, oh my God, four years, I'm behind. I better catch up. You know, I had this sense that I wasn't uh, performing or doing what I should be doing at a certain time. I'd sort of an internalized, I guess, super ego parental, may, maybe, projected fantasy of what I should achieve at a certain moment. So I said, well, you know, I really always decided, I've always loved photography, I'd really like to try and find a place where I could read, uh, research, and learn about photography, as well as make photographs. And I did, I found it in the US, in the UK, uh, in fact, in London, where I then moved. And by that time, my parents had moved there and uh, were renting a flat where I stayed temporarily because I the, the neighborhood, I, I did not like the neighborhood. It was Belgravia, it was Knightsbridge. It was a very upper middle class environment, very rich people and no fun, you know, very, uh, boring, uh, was in, still in my you know, early 20s, I really didn't want to hang out with a bunch of hooray, Henrys as they call them. Um, so I ended up moving somewhere else in London, which is more sort of edgy and working class. And I think to this day, I mean, I still, you know, I live in Hackney today in the East End. When I had decided to go to London, I arrived in London, stayed in my parents' apartment, and looked at some research, and found out that the school to try and get into was the Polycentral London. Why? 
because it had practicing photographers teaching you about the thoughts and the ideas as much as the technique of photography. So that attracted me. But in order to get in, it was very difficult to get in. And as a foreigner, you know, it's mainly British there, uh, you had to have a portfolio. So, so enrolled before submitting a portfolio to Polya Central London, I enrolled at the Harrow College of Technology and Art and found a professional photography course for, which was run by an advertising photographer. And he um, was teaching us how to use chambre, you know, the big cameras, and we did a lot of experimentation around that. Studio photography with big flash, you know, big, you know, used to have big electrical power like that, and quite, quite dangerous. You really had to know to be doing the right thing, otherwise the thing would blow up or something. So I learned that and I met there a, a, a very dear friend to this day called Olivier Richon and we used to go uh, during the evenings after class to the clubs and the clubs at that time were punk clubs so we would go and photograph the people the audience not that not we never photographed the celebrities of punk you know like Susie and the badge she's they were around but we were more interested in the audience so we began to do this project which we published uh, you know back in 2014 but also exhibited in many places and was the portfolio that got both of us into the Polya Central London. So there I met um, a very influential teacher for me who was Victor Bergen. He was one of the uh, founders of conceptual art and the use of photography in conceptual art. And so he was a very, very influential tutor. When I was thinking of going to the Polya Central London, I was reading already some of the essays he'd written on photography. And that was a real a draw to that course because he was teaching on it. And he ended up, you know, being my tutor too, which was great. So, uh, yeah, a real role model for me uh, as someone who was in constant revolution of thought, actually. It's not that uh, someone like Victor was, was like indoctrinating or anything, but there were frames of reference there, you know, in the seminar, which, you know, definitely picked my curiosity. And I, I looked at that. What was great was Victor was getting in all these wonderful people, you know, both from filmmakers, critical filmmakers, writers, people like Abigail Solomon Godot would get, come and give lectures, invi like an invited uh, lecture at the PCL, you know, and Constance Penley, who was involved in film journals in, uh, in, in the USA, in LA, and then Bill Owens discovered Bill, Bill Owens in the library, the PCL, Polya Central London Library, and was very amused. I thought it was so hilarious. So Victor got him in to give a talk, and he was fascinating the way he talked about his work. And, you know, he was citing anthropology and all of that, and, and how he, these were his friends, that he'd been a reporter in the area, and all this and that. And, but later, after the lecture and that, we went out to the pub and sitting next to Bill Owens, I said, well, now how do you photograph? Do you set something up? Is there a setting up? You know, there's a famous expression, I think that always stays with me, this expression about Brecht saying something about that in order to photograph the factory and the relations in the factory, something has to be set up to show those relations. And actually, I sort of, you know, being uh, immersed in this uh, point of view, to, I said, well, how do you shoot? Do you change things? Do you move things around? Because I was already began Belgravia series in my second year. And I know that when I went in, first of all, I would spend time talking to my subjects, the portrait, you know, people I was portraying. And then I would look at their, their, their living room like a theater, 
<laughs> and where do I place them? What is the most significant room in the house was usually the drawing, a living room, or it was the bedroom. You know, and there were very few bathrooms big enough. But if there were bathrooms, I would do bathrooms, but they're not. Um, so I, I was saying to him, well, you know, I move things around so that they, they work. He said, oh, no, I never, never move it. And I said, are you sure? But you're still constructing it by, no, no, I photograph what's there at the time, you know. So I had this little, you know, quite a friendly, you know, uh, a sort of di uh, argument with him. So yeah, so that was my uh, <laughs> my my sort of coming across uh, him uh, and having sort of beginning to form my identity as a photographer. And you know, you do it very often against figures that often you admire or that. And so you're sort of forming your identity as a creative against someone that has uh, some recognition, does interesting work, but you're also wanting to differentiate your, your methodology from theirs. Belgravia was a series that I first started as a second year student. And the way it started was me photographing my mother and my grandmother with the television in the living room. And on the television was Pierre Clémenti and Catherine Deneuve kissing. And it was the Buñuel film, Belle de Jour, that I knew very well. And so I, it was playing as I was photographing, because I they didn't have one of those freeze frames, my parents, so it was pr playing. So and I photograph asked my mother and my grandmother to wear their furs, and my grandmother had a drink in her hand, and my mother had a cigarette in her hand, and she was wearing boots, outdoors clothes inside, and my mo and my grandmother was wearing maybe her most uh, formal fancy. Uh, clothes for the photograph with her small mink. So they're sitting there and as Belle de Jour played and I was waiting for that uh, moment where I would photograph them and Pierre Clémenti and Catherine Deneuve kissing. So that was like really important, like this structure in the image, like there was an element of two people kissing two women far apart, behind them two objects. So I was very aware of these little anchoring points that I then uh, referred to in the text. Um, and I think the text was, I live in the 19th century, the early 19th century, um, fascinated by Napoleon and Metternich, two people already again, um, etc. So, you know, very aware of when I later put the text, she actually created the text for me. And um, I thought it was perfect, so I used it. The way I composed the text there uh, with those, all those different people who were, some were living in the same building my parents did, and friends of friends of friends, till I was photographing people. It was the geographical area of Belgravia, people my parents didn't even know. So what I would do was, I would be to go and meet them, have a coffee, or sometimes have a glass of wine, talk to them, explain to them the project. I was the nice girl next door and they would say, tell me things, which I would then say, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom and write them down. And as I worked it, I would, you know, I would have the text on like index cards and, and try them out. So mostly the text came after the image. The reason that for me worked best was it meant that the image was sometimes totally different than what was mentioned in the text, which sort of expanded the meaning and that visual space of the image itself. Uh, so text was really important. I, I chose type of typography, uh, school century school book, that you can still find actually when you use a computer, you know, it's one of the typographies for the, the text and this capitalization pointing to the artificiality and the irony of the text. Most 
uh, I went back and showed them with the um, with the text, and most said, "Well, that's that's what I that's my worldview. That's where I'm at. You know, uh, what well, that's it." And one woman, uh, one woman, my mother's best friend, was photographed in furs. Her profile framed by a, uh, an image, a map of Turkey. I think she's Turkish. And um, she said something like, I believe a woman should keep her kitchen clean. I saw two servants squeezing oranges, the sweat pouring off their foreheads into the juice. I did not allow my son to drink it. People have seen that and said, oh, it's like that in Egypt too. So it's really about being immersed in a worldview and a particular type of privileged ideology, I guess, of where you don't see the, the tragic consequences of that social division, you know, that you're referring to and taking for granted in, in your utterance that I then, you don't know, display. And the, another one is, I know of a beautiful marriage uh, she was a beautiful item in the house and if I had such a marriage I'd shoot myself and this is a beautiful woman on a couch. So when you're putting, she was saying that about a friend or once so often when you talk about someone else and then suddenly it really is about you. I was very aware. The other thing I was very aware in time was that the text under the photographs were all the options that I had and could have been. You know, each of those texts could have been me. I made choices in life to be critical of that sort of, you know, again, I use a very popular phrase, white privilege, you know, total white privilege in that neighborhood.